寡吗？Okay, I shall start now. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the first Royal Institute of Philosophy lecture we are holding this year. In fact, since the pandemic began, we haven't been able to hold any Royal Institute of Philosophy lectures. So last year's ones were postponed, and Shalini Sinha from Reading was one of our lecturers who was supposed to deliver a lecture last year, and we had to, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, not uh, hold it and we are so lucky now to have Shalini Sinha with us today to deliver her lecture on gender and race cross-cultural approaches. Um, I must uh, tell you a little bit about the Royal Institute of Philosophy lectures. We've held them in the University of Wolverhampton since 2003. So by now, I think we've had about 50 lectures and uh, from across the world, uh, well-known philosophers have come and delivered on a range of topics. Today's particular topic I am very excited about because it fits into the new course that we are beginning at the University of Wolverhampton. And this course is philosophy, religion, and ethics. So Shalini Sinha's topic just is absolutely squarely fits what we would like to do. So Shalini, if you were teaching us with us in Wolverhampton, you would be a, a star teacher. So uh, I am so happy to uh, introduce to Shalini to you. Uh, Shalini received her PhD from University of Sussex, and she has taught at the University of York uh, and at SOAS, University of London, before joining University of Reading. Her research focus is on topics in Indian philosophy, primarily Hindu and Buddhist metaphysics and ethics, also Jain philosophy, uh, philosophy of mind and philosophy of action. I must say that that's a very, very rare combination of someone who combines both Eastern and Western philosophy, an example of which you will see in today's lectures. Her publications include The Metaphysics of Self, uh, and this is in the Oxford Handbook of Indian Philosophy, which is edited by Janathan Kaneri. And actually, Janathan Kaneri came to deliver a Royal Institute of Philosophy, a lecture for us as well, a couple of years ago. So it's from your, from your part of the world, um, Shalini. So may I welcome you to uh, please commence your lecture. At the end of it, we will have uh, a spot for Q&A. I must tell everybody who's attending that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so please do not share any private information or comments in the chat box that you wouldn't like to remain embedded for posterity. <laughs> you should, it's not a moment which is just going to come and pass. Everything is going to be recorded and shared. We will leave enough time after Shalini's talk. I think about four, 35 to 40 minutes uh, for our discussion, but then we have to close at five o'clock. We must close at five o'clock. And I have a lecture at six to eight. I just told Shalini in, in Oxford University today. So otherwise I would love to carry on the discussion for an extra hour, Shalini, but we'll have to put that for another day. So welcome and let's hear Shalini on gender and race cross-cultural approaches. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much, Meena, for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here, and thank you for your kind words. Um, so today, I thought, I um, sort of when talking about cross-cultural approaches to gender and race, I'm going to focus on Buddhist perspectives and uh, bring in some feminist perspectives of Judith Butler in particular and the way that she appro uh, approaches gender and race. Now, we're going to look at uh, two aspects of Buddhist philosophy when uh, trying to see what sorts of philosophical tools and concepts we can use to think about uh, uh, gender and race. The first is uh, the Buddhist approach to self and identity. And the second is uh, the way in which Buddhists approach the question of classes. Now, Class in Sanskrit is uh, termed jati, and that refers to both natural and social classes. And social classes here include caste, and jati means caste as well. And uh, like uh, sort of Western philosophers, uh, the Buddhists think that uh, in our ordinary reality, we can distinguish certain kinds of natural classes as um, certain uh, groups uh, of objects, such as trees, plants, and animals, who we think have certain common characteristics uh, that are naturally given. And they distinguish this from uh, those classes such as, for example, castes such as Brahmins or merchants, which are, uh, construct, which are social constructions. 
Uh, and these, uh, and of course, they say, like many Western philosophers, that these social classes or social kinds, as we would say in antiquity philosophy, are uh, have characteristics which are conventionally uh, or socially uh, attributed to them. Okay. But the Buddhists go a step further than uh, Western philosophers and, in fact, uh, Indian philosophers, and they say that, in fact, both natural and social classes. Uh, those objects who we ordinarily uh, that we ordinarily take to be uh, such, um, but to be naturally given to us and socially given to us, all of these are actually conventionally constructed in some way. They are only conventional realities and truths. They are socially constituted in some fundamental way. But uh, we'll talk about what this means. Now, what they say is that uh, these objects whether they're natural or social, for example, whether they're men, women, uh, and they're black and white, uh, uh, with the idea of black and white identities, or they're uh, sort of uh, natural objects, such as we think to be natural objects such as trees and, and animals, these are nothing, these seeming holes and uh, unified holes, unities, are nothing but a set of causally connected parts, parts which arise in dependence on each other. So what they're saying is that, that those things that we take to be wholes, to be substantially existent objects and entities are nothing but a series of causally unified parts which arise in dependence on each other as mutually dependent parts uh, which we then take uh, to be a particular entity, a tree, or, uh, uh, um, or a gendered self, such as a woman. Now, this is uh, sort of um, um, talked about by the Buddhist nun Vajira, who uh, admonishes an interlocutor, a sort of a demonic interlocutor called Mara, uh, who um, wants to establish the idea that we really exist, that, this, that ourselves and identities are real in some way, that we are these substantially existing mental and physical things that we think of as me, as woman, man, as British, and so on. And uh, she says, why do you assume that such a thing as a being or a self exists? Here, that is where these different parts are uh, are composed as a composite unity, here there is no self, no being to be found. And just as a chariot is just an assemblage, um, a composite of parts which we designate chariot, so what we designate a self is just a conventional name for, um, um, for a series of unified parts which constitute what we take to be persons or human beings. And for the Buddhists, um, the parts that constitute uh, persons or human beings and the parts which constitute um, say certain kinds um, of objects such as tables, chairs or trees, these parts are the, um, are the more fundamental entities on the basis of which we compose and, uh, and conceptually unify the idea that this is a chariot, this is a human being, uh, uh, this is a tree. So these seeming holes are dependent on parts. These parts are arranged in the case of certain artifacts such as chariots and so on, according to conventional purposes. For example, a chariot is, has the purpose of being a mode of transportation. But the Buddhists are saying that even such things as trees, these naturally given objects are conceived in particular ways and their parts are conceived in particular ways and, uh, and um, they are conceptually organized and unified in ways that are socially given, that are socially constructed. So the conceptual uh, unity and identity which we ascribe to any object, be it what we take to be an object from a social class or a natural class, is, um, is a socially constructed unity, a conceptual unity to which we give a particular designation, self, human being, or chariot or car. Now the question arises that when these class, that how exactly are these classes of objects constituted? How are the boundaries of, uh, of, for example, such a thing as a tree established? Uh, 
how are these, uh, these boundaries established conventionally or socially? Now, as, we, uh, talk, uh, as I said before, um, what we take to be particular uh, individuals, particular objects, such as a tree, for the Buddhist are nothing but a collection of certain properties of certain parts. So for example, uh, we say that this is a red circle or this is a yellow circle. Now the Buddhist says, well, actually what we're talking about in that case are two, two properties. We're talking about the property of redness and the property of roundness. And it is simply our uh, social and personal concerns, our interests and desires, which lead us to pick out one property as constituting that individual, the property say of roundness, of being a circle, and then filling that up with certain uh, characteristics of that individual, such as being red or being yellow. And it's the same, th so all these things, such as for example, trees, plants, animals, uh, human beings, we pick certain constitutive properties uh, um, according to our interests uh, and along with those constitutive properties codependently, inseparably, we instantiate certain characteristic properties uh, um, which uh, sort of, which are the features of that individual, the tree or the, or the person, the human being or the animal. And what we pick out as constitutive uh, properties and the instantiating properties is determined by the kind of priorities we have, priorities of what we wish to know, or what our uh, social relationships think it is important to know. And of course, by the practical interests and concerns which motivate these kinds of, uh, of priorities of knowing uh, cognitive priorities. Now, in the case of human beings, Buddhists say that human beings are composed of five kinds of mental and physical properties, five kinds of parts, mental and physical parts, which uh, are causally connected and form a causally connected series of mental and physical events that we grasp as me and mine, as myself. Now, these five properties are physical form, that is to say the living body and its senses, uh, and as well as our sensory experiences, uh, which we might uh, find pleasurable or painful, heat or cold may be found to be pleasurable or painful. Uh, we also uh, form certain judgments on the basis of our sensory experiences. I mean, look outside and see that it's raining and judge that it's raining. And this judgment may be true or false. And we also have uh, certain kinds of volitional impulses, uh, willings, volitions, intentions, uh, which, uh, which guide our actions. And these are based on various sorts of habits, um, certain kinds of repetitive uh, um, attitudes, uh, desires, uh, and so on, which form over time and which, which, which tend to, um, to initiate certain kinds of intentional actions. But the, and the fifth property which we have is awareness or consciousness. And this is consciousness, not just of the other four properties of our bodies and senses, of our uh, sensory uh, uh, pleasures and pains, of our judgments and volitions and our habits. It's also a consciousness of being conscious and of being able to evaluate these properties uh, which we have. For the Buddhists, the five properties we are composed of uh, are the are those that we experience. Uh, this idea of what constitutes a person, a human being, comes from experience. And if we observe our experience, we see that only these kinds of properties come up in our experience of what we are uh, as human beings uh, and what we, we see of, of other people as human beings. So these are the five uh, elements, the five mental and physical properties which we designate a self as that which is me or mine, our beliefs, our thoughts, our ideas, our bodies and bodily parts, our hair, our desires, volitions, and so on, and our awareness of these. Okay. What distinguishes the Buddhist idea of self uh, from uh, both other Indian philosophies and uh, with a, from a great many uh, Western philosophical traditions is the idea that self is a doing, 
it's not a being, it's not a substantially existent thing, any kind of a self, gendered or racial se or racialized selves, uh, ethnic selves, uh, uh, religious identities, none of these are beings. They're naturalized as beings. They're thought to be beings and existing and existence, but they are in fact doings. We make self, we make that which is I and mine. And this rests on the idea that self is simply the sense of ownership or possessiveness which we have. And this actually is uh, the same uh, to a degree as most other Indian philosophies who think that the ordinary idea of self is just the egotistical self, which is, uh, which is a kind of possessiveness, a sense of owning certain bodily and uh, mental uh, properties as me, mental states and properties as me. But the way in which self arises as the sense of ownership for the Buddhist is by grasping, by appropriating the five types of properties which make us up, which constitute us. Self arises in dependence on these five kinds of properties and cannot arise except in such dependence. So whatever we take to be a self is a constitutive property, for example, black selves, gendered selves, ethnic selves, and so on, uh, religious selves. These are the constitutive properties uh, which have certain instantiating properties as characteristics. And the sense of, of, the, of the substantially existing self and its particular properties uh, is grasped, is appropriated, is laid claim to by our interests, our desires, our practical concerns, both socially and personally. And grasping itself, this appropriating, laying claim to these properties as me or, as me or mine, imputes them with a sense of solidity a sense of substantiality when, whenever we start thinking about, well, am I going to fail this exam or, you know, what's going to happen to me if I lose my job and so on, we're grasping and clinging to certain ideas, to certain thoughts as me or mine. And those thoughts or uh, those bodily parts and entire bodies are imputed with this uh, a kind of hard substantive reality, which a sort of a density, which they didn't have otherwise. And it is this securing of solidity, of substantiality that is the self as a doing. The, um, there is nothing substantial in this world, which uh, a, a, there is no substantial existence, no substance, substantially existing thing, which is not a product of grasping. We impute the sense of substantiality of selfhood, which, which are interlinked and inseparable on both our mental and bodily parts and on the objects of the world, the car, the trees, the, my house as me or mine. And this is a very subtle grasping. The initial grasping itself, the beginning of grasping something is the imputation of a solidity, substantiality on that object or set of objects. And these are appropriated and conceptualized as a unity, as a substantial unity. So this is a conceptual construction of, uh, of, uh, of any kind of object, be it a self or be it uh, an object out in the world. Now, when we talk about the arising, the dependent arising of social selves, how we arise uh, as, for example, uh, racialized or gendered selves, ethnic selves, religious selves, and so on, certain kinds of uh, nationalistic selves, nationalistic identities, these, these kinds of selves arise in dependence, in dependence on, uh, in causal and conditioned relationships to, various kinds of conventional truths. Uh, that is to say, the way in which the world is thought to be, the names which we give to things, as well as the practical interests, desires, and purposes that inform our, uh, our, our life in the world socially. And through this, we end up picking out certain properties uh, of uh, the person, what, what is called the person, some of those five properties which arise causally uh, as constitutive of being black, of being white, of being woman or being uh, man. And each of these, con these constituted individuals and this class of individuals, man, woman, black, white, and so on, is inseparable from those properties that are grasped as being its particular characteristics. So we attribute 
we might attribute certain uh, physical reproductive uh, properties to being a woman. These might be the sex attributes, the, the reproductive organs uh, and certain uh, kinds of facial and bodily features to women, as well as certain ways of acting and behaving, which or it's a certain emotional properties which we take to be womanly or ca to characterize aspects of womanhood. And we talk about it in this way. And similarly, we might think of the idea of being a of being a black person, uh, um, a racialized self, as, insta as instantiating certain kinds of visible features, certain kinds of hair, skin, color, uh, structure, uh, facial structure, uh, and uh, in uh, sort of uh, racist uh, ideologies, as instantiating certain kinds um, of uh, mental capabilities, intellectual abilities, certain kinds of moral abilities, perhaps, you know, uh, um, the idea that certain groups of people are more prone to addiction, for example. So these, of all these characteristics, uh, mental and physical, are instantiated as those properties which are inseparable from that particular substantive self, uh, designated woman, black, white, etc., and so on, or an ethnic self, and so on. So these particular kinds of selfhood are effects of appropriative practice. And it's very important to understand there's been a great deal of talk about power and how uh, it's involved in constituting identity and selfhood. If we uh, think about the Buddhist view, we might say that appropriating, appropriative practices which identify things and claim a certain identity uh, say that this is what, that this is a black uh, woman, for example, or um, and and in uh, related ways designate various objects in the world, spaces, times, and so on. These kinds of appropriative uh, activity of our bodies, our behavior, our uh, verbal expressions, uh, linguistic expressions, and of our thoughts and ideas. These kinds of appropriative actions claim those things and substantialize them in so that they have a certain limited being as this bounded object which has these particular limited characteristics. So we end up grasping, identifying and naturalizing certain limited conceptions of what we are and what the world is, be it uh, to do with gender or race or anything else to do with our nationalities. So we might think of the act of appropriating itself by body, speech, or mind, as the Buddhists would say, as the, the locus, uh, as the exercise of power, which substantializes limited being, naturalizes various kinds of limited being, limited selves, and limited objects. And this, of course, uh, is uh, sort of is um, is parallel to the view of, of some uh, feminist philosophers, for example, Judith Butler, who thinks that gender and gender itself are performatively constituted. That is, they come into existence through our social practices, the way in which we, uh, the way in which uh, we speak uh, and so on, uh, institutionalized ways of speaking, acting and so on, bring the idea of gender into existence. And she has a very particular notion of, for example, sexed body. She says that the body as a body which can be a bearer of certain kinds of sex attributes, say reproductive organs, which are identified as male or female. The very idea of sexed bodies or racialized bodies is something which is performatively constituted. It comes into existence as a doing through our uh, speech and through these various institutionalized forms of speaking and acting and so on. Sex bodies, she says, are the effects of, uh, and gender itself, are the effects of certain regulatory social norms and values and practices. These, the repetitive practice of these norms imbues a substantiality on these, uh, um, creates the illusion of there being a substantive self, there being this category of woman. And this um, rests partly on the nature of a language, which is that doing requires a doer, verbs need subjects, and the repetition of this, of these uh, discursive, these sorts of ways of speaking, of verbal activity, written uh, speech and so on, leads to the substantialization of the idea of not only gender, but of the sexed body, of a body 
which uh, of the idea of a pure body, which can have attributes where this uh, idea of the body is constituted by a various kinds of uh, um, sort of uh, gendered discourse, gendered speech, gendered practices. And a similar thing with, with uh, the creation of the racialized body. Now, the Buddhists would agree with this, of course. Uh, the Buddhists would say that, yes, the body as a body, as a substance, which has certain attributes, be they sex or race attributes, is, of course, socially constructed. It's not natural. Um, insofar as we are picking out from a collection of properties according to our practical values, interests, uh, concerns, we're picking out certain uh, properties which are constitutive, say, for example, of being a woman, being a man. And then we are uh, um, sort of instantiating certain properties as characteristics. But the Buddhists would say that this comes about through appropriative conceptualizing and naming. It's something with Butler and all, do not really have this idea of appropriative uh, acts in that sense of how the idea of self and substantiality itself is constructed, nor do they really go into the sort of metaphysics which underpins sort of gender and so on, uh, to the extent that the Buddhists do, for example, there isn't as much discussion of how it is that the things of the world hang together as uh, causally connected processes, as uh, causally connected properties and so on. That's a very Buddhist view. Okay, so it is, uh, it is uh, by eye making, which drives uh, conceptualization and linguistic practices of naming, that we come to grasp these causally connected properties as substantial existence. And these uh, constitutive and instantiating properties, for example, gender and what's and its sex attributes, or race and, and race attributes, co-arise as the appropriative effects um, of various uh, mental, verbal, and bodily acts, both socially and personally. So, and here we've talked about this, the exercise of power, both at the collective and social level by groups, or it could be at a personal level by individuals, and both are really needed uh, to consolidate uh, the idea of substantive selfhood. Now, one of the things to consider is that, and it's, a, it's quite a strong claim, and Buddhists don't always put it in this way, but for them, um, the fundamental error which we engage in is the positing, the grasping of a self. It is responsible for all our sufferings. Uh, we can talk about this later. And although the Buddhists focus on the personal aspects of suffering and the personal aspects of uh, of establishing a self or an identity, this uh, applies for those in, in socially engaged Buddhism, uh, in socially engaged Buddhism, to collective identities, collective selves, be they ethnic, religious, uh, national, or, um, or gendered, and of race. And the fundamental grasping of a self, uh, this process of selfing, self as a doing, is also a process of othering because. Establishing a self is establishing an other. There is no self without an other. There is no man without a woman. There is no Britisher without someone without the non-British, and so on and so forth. There is no uh, white without a white person without a black person. So the setting up of these conventional boundaries, these conventional classes, apply particularly to human beings. Is, the, uh, is a kind of a violence. It is ethically problematic and harmful because these boundaries uh, lead to various kinds of, of what the Buddhist would consider harmful and unethical at times uh, behaviors, um, bodily behaviors, verbal acts, uh, cognitive uh, acts of various kinds, the ideas we have, the, the way we think about each other, the way we respond to each other with anger and hatred, perhaps. Uh, this is a product uh, with fear, for example, as a threat. This is a product of instituting boundaries of self and other, and there can be no self without an other for the Buddhist, because conceptualizing a self brings the conceptualization of an other. Selfing is othering. And that is a problem. And self-centeredness, uh, 
the, the division which this kind of self-centeredness brings about is of course a hierarchical division a relational division at an individual level of course of me as the center as opposed to you and all that i i think is not beneficial or harmful to me i reject with perhaps fear or anger and so on but at the level of collective identities we again have relational hierarchies whether they're gender hierarchies race hierarchies uh, ethnic hierarchies religious hierarchies this applies across the board that these hierarchy that these identities are appropriated cognitively, uh, emotionally, and behaviorally in ways that are harmful and lead to suffering for both myself and others individually and collectively. And uh, there is a statement by Simone de Beauvoir who says that the masculine or the, or the man, the male, is what counts as the subject or self, and the feminine is the other, the abject, the marginalized. And we can say a similar thing, of, of course, about, uh, about white persons uh, or, uh, you know, about uh, being uh, Indian or Chinese or being uh, Christian or Hindu or Muslim or being uh, um, a Brahmin and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, this applies across the board. Right. Now, both Buddhists and uh, 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 Butler, Judith Butler, are in agreement that we suffer under the illusion of substantial, of substantiality, of there being a substantial self, an agent and a subject who does various things, uh, which can be a gendered self, a gendered identity or a racial identity or, or, or any other kind of identity. But whereas uh, feminist philosophers and race theorists focus really on the social aspects of selfhood, the Buddhist is really talking about the very idea of self, the very idea of substance being an illusion, because uh, what we take conventionally to be these substantial unities are nothing but causally co-arising and conditioned um, properties. We just, all that there is are streams of unified parts or properties which arise in dependence on each other according to our interests, values, and so on and so forth, our habits, uh, our intentional acts. For the Buddhists, uh, this kind of analysis, uh, the very idea of uh, thinking about how the world is and uh, deconstructing it, deconstructing substances and selves, seeing these as fabrications, uh, um, but just as Butler and other feminists try to do. This uh, activity itself is an ethical activity. Deconstructing the world is an ethical activity. Deconstructing what we are, ourselves, is an ethical activity. It comes from realizing that all identities, all conceptions of selfhood are fabrications, the social fabrications and personal fabrications, according to the various interests and so on we have. But for the Buddhists, what we need to realize is that we are appropriating something from a collection of qualities and taking a particular quality to be fundamental, constitutive, constitutive or individuating uh, one object from another. And we are, and by seeing things, including ourselves, as this sort of bundle of changing qualities, which are causally connected according to our beliefs, our desires, and so on, we can decenter ourselves, we can dissolve the sense self-centeredness, this divisiveness of self and other of us and them. And whenever we're addressing a problem or just meeting someone or uh, responding to uh, various ethnic cultures, religious cultures, uh, cultures of gender and so on, we do so by seeing each as a not as substances that have certain qualities that we react to with anger or hatred or fear, but as, as, as causally connected properties, as collections of property, properties. So whether we admire those properties or we find them to be unbeneficial and harmful, we can see how they arise and address the causes and conditions that give rise to it and either emulate them if we think of them as virtuous or try and do something about the causes of harm. This is an impartial action and, uh, and um, this is a set of actions and responses which is impartial because it is based on the nature of things as causally uh, dependent, as conditioned by other uh, causes and conditions. And it leads to a kind of an unbinding of properties, the, the possibility 
of, uh, of having fluid uh, um, sort of constructions of individuality, of classes, of objects, uh, of, self and, uh, of self and other, because as long as we're not grasping things, we can functionally navigate the world without this kind of divisive opposition, which is harmful and leads to suffering and violence. We can unbind our properties and allow a, a flourishing of properties and, uh, and sort of a transient in, in individuating um, or taking a property to be constitutive, uh, which is transparent and uh, known to be fabricated and, and ethically conceived. This ethics of de-selfing, of, of non-appropriation is what Buddhists call the middle path. It's a path which prioritizes ethics and uh, it prioritizes ethics, uh, the values of what is taken to be, to alleviate suffering first and foremost, by a discriminating insight into how substances and selves are constructed. And it seeks to change our desires, our cravings, our passions, uh, and our delusion of substantiality and selfhood uh, to allow the cultivation of emotional uh, and uh, cognitive virtues, um, sort of ideas with, which are ethical, emotional responses, uh, which are ethical, uh, both at a collective and at a personal level, by expanding the idea of self, of taking the other to be self, and cultivating virtues such as compassion, compassionate care, which, for example, was, uh, was used in India by what you might call the socially engaged uh, Buddhist Ambedkar. So, uh, yes, I think that's basically the gist of this presentation, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, we can look at questions now. Uh, Mira, I can't hear you. You just unmute, it's me now. Yes, now you can hear me. Uh, yeah, I was muted, I think, to avoid making noises while you were speaking. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Shalini Sina. That was a really lovely talk. And um, we are now open to uh, questions and answers. And to kick off, I'm going to try and ask you um, a very small question. So a number of things that you've said about uh, the ethics of uh, the selfing and about understanding the way in which uh, a fluid self is substantiated, made to seem whole because of all kinds of interests, et cetera, all, all seem to be very individual actions. So what I want to know is that because the Buddhists also have an idea of a Sangha, a Sang, a collectivity, what sort of, what sort of actions would a collectivity engage in? Why is the collectivity important? Why is it important to be with other people? Mm. I think that's a very good question. Uh, one of the things to realize is that uh, the Buddhist idea of a community or Sangha traditionally is really the community of monks and possibly the community of monks and lay people. The Buddhists are not really social reformers and certainly not revolutionaries traditionally. Uh, it's partly because um, I think this is a move uh, that uh, if you are uh, openly and uh, radically socially opposed uh, to an order uh, that would prevent the dissemination of these ideas and practices. But I think that's only a part of it. In line with most Indian philosophies uh, of, that, uh, of that time, they really, are, uh, they really are concerned with individuals. And although they are very critical of naturalizing castes, they don't have similar things to say historically about gender. That's why I was talking about a Buddhist approach rather than what particular Buddhists thought a thousand years ago in a particular cultural context. So we're sort of um, a rethinking these philosophies as is done in, in a Western philosophy, you know, uh, in all sorts of manners. Um, I think to look at uh, the idea of collective and community responses, you'd have to look at socially engaged Buddhism. So you could look at um, some of the communities. I mean, you had, but again, there were individual actions. Um, but well, you can look at uh, the Dalai Lama, for example. He's very, very clear that the way to respond uh, to, uh, to, the, to the Chinese um, adoption 
of uh, Tibet uh, as a part uh, of China is through, through a particular ethics of collective action, which must be nonviolent because he says that, well, if we engage, we're trying to preserve our culture and ethical culture. And if we engage in violent action, the sort of divisiveness of self and other and not a common human qualities and, uh, and values, we will lose that culture. There'll be nothing left to say. So that is an example where uh, it has been used, but it's not always used. I mean, simply being a Buddhist or a Christian and so on, or being um, a social reformer or a socialist does not necessarily make one ethical at a practical level. Uh, all sorts of ideas are used in, you know, can be um, there together with all sorts of uh, harmful behavior. Yeah, but of course, uh, Ambedkar's Navayana Buddhism does give a lot of importance to the collective. Yes, that is socially engaged for this. Yeah. Okay, so we have a few questions coming up very quickly, but there was one in the chat, which I will just say to you because it came first. Uh, and that was, this, can we call a tree an object or is it subjective? I'd say trees are living beings. It's more like a comment. So ah, uh, no, uh, so the tree is an object. It's, um, it, um, it's a public object. We all see it. Uh, it is visible to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it does belong, it is a naturally given object at a conventional level. Uh, it is uh, not simply something which is, uh, because this, it, it is a conventional truth, which is a socially constructed truth, which we adopt and we use. What they're talking about, what the Buddhist is simply saying is the way that truth is constructed is, is social, right? It's not some sort of a naturally given thing. The laws of physics do have to do with our epistemic priorities, with our priorities of knowing in a certain kind, perhaps of capitalist culture, you might say, and so on. Um, um, indigenous peoples do not have the laws of physics. So, so there is a, a cultural and a social aspect to what we take to be, uh, to how we conceive the natural. And we may not even have, uh, for example, in certain communities that, uh, you know, there isn't really a natural social division of the same kind. Trees are articulations of a common vital spirit. Uh, so it's an entirely different conception of natural objects. We have to realize that ours is, uh, our um, idea of nature is very, very particular and culturally specific. Thank you. So we've got a few more questions. Uh, if I hope people don't mind my saying their name. Oh, oh, excuse me, Mira. Sorry. One other thing. Uh, I, the rest of the question was, I'd say trees are living beings. Yes. Yeah, so there is a debate. Uh, so um, in early Buddhism, plants and trees are, they're always living beings, but um, um, a certain other uh, traditions like the Jainas are uh, much more uh, interested in uh, plants being uh, living beings. So by an object, uh, we're lo looking at objects which are living and non-living. I'm using it across the board. We're looking at the animate and inanimate world. It's just... Uh, yes, thank you. That was, that's a good uh, distinction. The, the question of objectivity and subjectivity is separate from the question of what in the collection of objects, what do you count? And you count living beings in that collection of what yes. is objectively there. Right. Yes, for simplicity, uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. So um, uh, there's a question from James Lovelock. Thank you for a really interesting presentation. I was wondering about how non-binary identities fit with Buddhist philosophy. For example, mixed race identities, non-binary gender and bisexuality. Could you repeat that about how? Um... About how non-binary identities fit with Buddhist philosophy? Ah, so non-binary. Yes, yeah, so I was trying to say this at the end, and in fact, I earlier had the term a binary there. The distinction of self and other uh, really sets up for the Buddhist various kinds of conceptual binaries, where one is not uh, possible, we cannot conceive of one without the other. We cannot conceive of man without the woman, uh, of black without uh, white, and so on. And the idea that we should, uh, uh, start looking at that we should start desubstantializing and deconstructing these binary identities, which they think are actually harmful. Um, uh, for the most part, yeah, they, which they think are harmful and lead to very, and they're, and they're a product of appropriative activity uh, rather than a sort of a non appropriate activity. So, by not having this appropriative um, uh, consolidation of a binary uh, identities by deconstructing uh, our uh, sort of binary identities and seeing that this is actually a collection of qualities that we arbitrarily uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of 
contain within these kinds of, bi of binary oppositions. Through this kind of deconstruction, we can, in fact, if, as I said, sort of uh, unbind uh, these properties and qualities. So we can create more fluid individuals who we don't take to be absolutely substantially real. We just think that they're uh, useful and uh, you know, uh, for certain purposes. Uh, so we have much more fluid identities. And so we don't suffer from this idea that I am like this or I must be like this, which can lead to all sorts of problems, for example, for, for transgender people and so on. They can be suffering after a certain change. So we're not grasping or clinging to these kinds of binary distinctions. We're allowing fluidity uh, because we realize that individuals are uh, practically constituted by our interests and desires. Right. And, and substantializing them is harmful. Good. It leads to the next question. This is by Paul Moore Bridger. I think he teaches philosophy in King Edwards. So Paul is asking, are identities something to be ultimately overcome? Is identity focused individual or collective action fundamentally misguided? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, so th now this is a, um, a very important point and that's why I made the distinction between a non-appropriative and appropriative uh, uh, conceptualizing and naming. Uh, now, the Buddhists will be the first to agree that we are a bundle, as they would say, a collection of various qualities. We think, we believe, uh, we... Uh, desire, we conceptualize, we have the faculty of, of a language, of naming, and these are the way we are, uh, as long as we have a human existence. Uh, they think that grasping uh, um, any kind of a positing of self-identity, uh, which is based on grasping, uh, is harmful, right? But conventionally, we do have to name things, we do use concepts, and we do refer to I and you. We, um, uh, we have cultural distinctions. The Buddhists are not saying don't make these conventional distinctions. They think that conventional reality and conventional truths are essential for navigating the world, right? Um, everything may be a collection of parts, but I think, but if I think that the table is not really there, uh, I'm going to bump into it, right? So to negotiate the world, we need to, uh, uh, we need to negotiate, we need to use uh, these conventional truths, uh, these conventional names, uh, such as I and you, uh, tree and table and chair. But we must not take these to be, to refer to substantially existing things. We must not take this to be ultimate truths. It's only if we see this, uh, these as social fabrications, as conveniences, as mere conventions, that we, that we have the possibility of changing these not hanging on to them. Uh, we have, there is so much violence in the name of a particular kind of self and another. Human history is littered with it. So it's not uh, having no uh, identity, not having any self, but not thinking of these as ultimately real, as substantial. Seeing these as very transparent, fluid, constructed. Does that answer the question? Yes, so, but, so you would, I mean, an answer specifically that is, identity focused individual or collective action misguided. Uh, you can't say that it is um, it, misguided yeah. per se. Uh, right, so uh, in a way, now, now this is a very interesting point. So the Buddhist would of course focus on qualities and properties, right? So for example, uh, and, uh, um, and, and I think the example say Martin Luther King is quite important here or even Nelson Mandela. They would suggest that ethical action uh, is something in which you can talk about black people, you can talk about, uh, you can talk about women, you can talk about Tibetans, but that's, uh, but the focus is on the humanity, uh, the, the, those uh, ethical qualities, say, of equality, of having a certain kind of expression, of being free of oppression uh, for all human beings and of myself as a human being rather than myself as a Tibetan or a Buddhist. Right. So uh, it's uh, it's wearing these identities lightly, if you like, transparently, uh, knowing that what we're fighting for are more fundamental qualities, uh, which are ethical, seeing people in certain ways, not uh, in, in, in racist ways, not in uh, hierarchically gendered ways or hierarchically uh, sort of, you know, hierarchical ethnicities or religions, you know, would be the same. So one has to be careful in one's use of identities. It has to be uh, very lightly worn and expressed. Yeah, thank you, that's, that's very good. Uh, so we move on to the next set of a few more questions and we 
we've got a limited time. So Atri Mazumdar says, thank you for the intriguing and intellectually stimulating lecture. You spoke about the metaphysical underpinning of selfhood. Can you please elucidate this point vis-a-vis -vis the intersubjectivity between the self and the other? Okay, so um, for the Buddhists, uh, both what I take to be me and what I take to be you, self and other, we're just a bundle of qualities, right? Uh, but, but each of us is, is a unified stream or a unified series of qualities, which is causally connected. Hence, I can distinguish that that's you and this is me. That's a table, that's a chair, that's a tree. These are all uh, seeming holes in some way. Now, if I grasp myself as me, Shalini, and I'm this, um, I don't know, I'm a woman, uh, you know, and I'm fixated on the idea of my womanhood. And I use this sometimes in class, you know, that, uh, that you know, that there was a survey and uh, they found that women who have cancer very often, they're more uh, worried about losing their hair. That's a greater source of suffering, you know, something more painful than perhaps losing a breast. And this was a survey. And this is the sort of thing that, you know, we're so fixated, you know, on the self, whether it's, you know, it's growing old, but also, you know, it could be an ethnic identity or a religious identity, you know, uh, you have uh, a certain kind of, uh, it's always troublesome to talk about specific cases and this because it's a live issue, but we can imagine that if I have a certain kind of identity as, um, let's say, um, as, um, as a British church, I'm, I'm say as a woman, um, and it's a very strong identity and, and, and I set up an other or say if I think of myself as a Hindu and, and I have the whole class of non-Hindus, for example, then um, um, anything which I feel invades or, uh, it, you know, is not beneficial to my being a Hindu or my being a woman is something which is full of fear, it's a threat, and I might uh, react angrily um, to that person's speech, uh, to that person's action you know, who is acting in certain ways that I find are threatening. If I start to see the other person as uh, causally uh, connected and causally arising properties, I'll say, well, look, the, the speech of that person, their way, their ideas, their way of talking, their behaving, even if it's violent, is a result, their anger, perhaps, their, uh, uh, you know, their violent action, uh, say, perhaps a terrorist action, you know is a product of certain causes and conditions. And I begin to look at the causes and conditions of that problem. And then I'm not reacting to this person as me versus you, right? My emotions, my way of thinking has changed completely. The intersubjective relationality there has shifted beyond the idea of division and self and other to, try, to trying to impartially that is in a non-self-centered way and not a way of self and other, trying to resolve that issue responding to others uh, um, in any context, uh, in a way which is not uh, um, divisive in terms of self and other emotionally, say with fear or tension or and, and such things in, uh, in my speech or in my, uh, in my attitudes and my behavior. The way I walk and talk might change. I'm more relaxed. I'm not bound by these, uh, these conventional boundaries of what I am and what the other is. I can respond more intelligently to any situation. Thank you. Uh, there are a few more and we just have about uh, four, five or six minutes to go. So we have a question from uh, Ravindra Varma from India. How Dr. Ambedkar related to Bodh Dharam while in his life he was a Hindu. In all his life he was a Hindu, so how did he relate to Bodh Dharam? Now, I'm not an expert on Ambedkar, uh, um, but uh, what I would say is that um, for a, um, if you are that from the point of view of Buddhist philosophy, all of these identities, whether it's uh, being a Hindu, uh, being a Brahmin, being a Dalit, uh, I don't know, being a merchant or an aristocrat, these are all constructed. So uh, we have the possibility of uh, of changing our identities uh, 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 and not taking them very seriously, not taking the identities which we are born with too seriously but also not taking any identities that we might seek to adopt because we find them interesting or beneficial in some way. Uh, 
we don't take those too seriously either. We're not bound by the idea of activity. What we take seriously is the practice of dharma, that is the practice of ethical action, right? Uh, so uh, for a good Buddhist, what should define with uh, Hindu dharma or Buddhist dharma or any religion or any activity is ethical conduct. And that means, uh, uh, um, and that means ethical cognition, the right sorts of ideas and ways of thinking about things, ethical speech, uh, um, our words and so on must be carefully, they mustn't be divisive, harsh, angry, and so on, just reactive and negative, and um, sort of um, an ethical uh, action, physical action. So, uh, I, yeah, I will just quickly add because we, I do teach on Ambedkar. Ambedkar decided in 1935, 20 years before he died, that he was not going to remain a Hindu. He had announced it and he took that many years to study. He did a serious study of religion. And at the end of this end of his life, uh, he had completed a huge tome, the Buddha and his Dhamma. It's his version of Navayana Buddhism, which uh, was published posthumously. So he didn't obviously write it only in a day. He spent many, many, many years studying. So I would say that it is incorrect to say that in all his life he was a Hindu. You know, so it's a bit of a. Um, um, and I think it's important to say here uh, when people talk about changing or say, for example, adopting another uh, identity, another ideology, that there is always the possibility of changing within a certain identity and taking it very lightly. So, for example, Narayan Guru was a Dalit, what, 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 he was uh, a lower caste uh, philosopher in India, and uh, he uh, did not become a Buddhist, but he was able to think about uh, whatever the received traditions were extremely differently in non-divisive ways uh, and disagreed with uh, caste uh, sort of div uh, divisions and hierarchies. And we have this in the, in, in the Hindu tradition uh, for a thousand years uh, with uh, what are called the devotional uh, philosophers and so on, you know, where they reject certain kinds of divisiveness uh, by, uh, by caste or race or gender and so on. Yeah, but it was precisely the fluidity and the non-graspingness and the collectivity of Buddhism that attracted Amitabha. Yeah, so but one should be careful that's possible. Now, this is quite an important point uh, because it's very sort of uh, live at the moment in uh, and very topical. Uh, it's possible uh, not only in Buddhism, but it's possible in all of the Indian traditions it, because very often there is a disconnect between uh, the what you find is that where certain principles lead to socially and so on is not where they go to because uh, the person uh, or that uh, that uh, particular class or caste wants to uh, sustain certain uh, relationships so um um, all religion is an ideology, and uh, Buddhism is also uh, an ideology. They'll be the first to say it, hence they say don't grasp and, you know, this idea of being a Buddhist. Use the tools effectively, and you can use the tools, I would say, of any religion or any ideology, uh, ethically or non-ethically. And sometimes, unfortunately, they're used unethically because people are so driven by their own interests and their fears and desires. Okay, uh, uh, there's another question by Atri Mazumdar, but I hope she'll understand because we have little time. I'm going to move first to the other two, then I'll return to this if we have a minute. So there's a question by Drishti Desai. Within Mahayana Buddhist belief, only being born in the form of a man can one achieve enlightenment. What is the purpose of gender in such a claim? And how does that reflect the philosophy of the self? Is the idea different in the early Pali texts of what we classify as Theravada Buddhism? So here's a scholarly question for you. Okay, so um, I'm going to answer this very generally. One of the things I said at the beginning was uh, that, I, that I'm not looking at how, uh, in a partic how particular Buddhist, particular Buddhist philosophers looked at gender. Uh, it's simply because uh, they are bound by their context, uh, as all philosophies are, even feminist philosophy is context bound and has limitations, race theories have, you know, even critical, you know, sort of all our theories do. Um, I was trying to pick out uh, certain tools which we can use in various ways because they are quite distinct and one can, uh, you know, you can use this from Buddhism or certain particular aspects of Hindu philosophy and so on, or even the Brahmanical traditions. Um, it's not completely clear that in Mahayana Buddhism as such, 
women cannot attain enlightenment uh, because say in Tibetan Buddhism, Japanese and so many other Buddhisms, it has happened. But yes, there will also be statements to that effect. So um, this is a problem of the cultural context uh, and the gender issues are there. So uh, if you're, so I'm not quite certain. I mean, uh, so, so we need to subject uh, those ideas to the same kind of analysis that you know, we've done that they're really inconsistent uh, in my view to uh, Buddhist uh, philosophical uh, principles, uh, the philosophy. Um, Amira, am I missing something? Uh, yeah, the I think they're, they're asking whether, whether in, uh, uh, is the idea of gender, that is man, only man can achieve enlightenment according to Mahayana Buddhist, is this different in early Pali texts? of what we classify in Theravada. So this is about the different traditions of Buddhism. Yeah, Japan yeah. is superior. Yeah, um, so even in Mahayana Buddhism, uh, so uh, we have about 18 different early Buddhist schools and we have even in the Mahayana tradition, a great many schools. Uh, some of them do say that uh, women uh, cannot, a few of them say that um, women cannot achieve enlightenment. But you know this is variable to a degree, uh, and uh, I cannot speak for all of Theravada Buddhism uh, because, after all, uh, you did have Buddhist nuns and so on. So it's not that they, you know, that no one can, that no woman can achieve uh, enlightenment. I mean, you'd need uh, somebody who's more of a religious uh, study scholar and has scoured the literature. Uh, so fortunately, as a philosopher, I don't have to lay claim to that. <laughs> so I'm sorry, um, I cannot really uh, give you a scholarly answer about every, you know, about a whole range of traditions. Uh, but I would say there is some variety in that, uh, in that view. It's not uh, the same. And I think we have time for really one last question because we have to close. It's already three minutes past five. And I'm going to uh, say, Ever, this is a question from Naomi Davis. So in conventional naming, the point is to take the depth of meaning out of names we use to make them more fluid and equal. I wouldn't say it's the depth which is taken out, but the solidity, uh, the naturalness, because when we say this is a tree or when you say that, you know, uh, for example, I am Shalini, if, uh, if that naming is an appropriative activity, I'm solidifying, substantializing the idea of me as this body, mind, these beliefs, these thoughts, desires, these particular physical and mental attributes. Um, so we're taking, we're desubstantializing. We're making these identities somewhat hollow. And in later Buddhism, you have this idea that when you take out that substantiality, the idea of self, of a substantial core, you see things in a way as hollow, in a way, as, as empty of that kind of substantiality. Um, and that's what they sometimes say, you know, that we see things as a bit more dreamlike. Uh, but the Buddha himself says, you know, uh, that he sees these five uh, properties which make us up the five aggregates as they're called uh, material form as being somewhat empty, ephemeral. There's a much more ephemeral view of things. Uh, they're seen more lightly. They're still there. They're still navigated. You're still going to bump into the table. But we approach things in a uh, in a way which is less grasping, less substantializing. And so we have a possibility of moving more fluid, uh, fluidly, if you like, uh, in our thoughts, in our actions and emotions. We're not stuck on things, we're not fixated, we're not addicted to our forms of thought, speech and uh, sense of ourselves. Okay, just so that uh, he doesn't feel there's a really, uh, the question is interesting, so I will ask the last question. If the substance self is an illusion and causally conditioned, what do we ascribe free will and locus of agency to? Excellent question, no, which the Buddha is always trying to tackle. Now my view of this, and there are different views of this, okay, we have a bundle of causally connected events. Uh, the person, uh, the human being, is nothing but uh, a, a, a group of mental and physical properties which are causally connected and which are constantly changing because they arise in causal dependence on each other and are conditioned by each other. Okay. The fourth uh, property, the fourth aggregate as it's called, is volitional action, is volitions, uh, in, intentions. Now, the, these are conditioned by habits, by what they call mental imprints, by, you know, a, a sort of uh, tendencies, uh, the ways in which we've acted and thought in the past and so on. They're conditioned by all these things, but they're subject to evaluation because we have the property of awareness. 
of reflective deliberative, deliberative thinking. So we can evaluate our volitions, we can evaluate uh, our thoughts, our desires and so on, and we can change them. So we have the ability to evaluate and to act freely in any given context. Free will is not this autonomous entity. Uh, which is, uh, you know, which is able to act freely. That's a substance view. And for the Buddhists, it's mistaken. I always have the possibility of intentional action. That is karma. Absolutely crucial to the Buddhists, the Hindus, the Jews. Karma is intentional action, and that has certain effects. I would not be able to change myself if I did not have the possibility of, if you like, free will, but not free will as an autonomous agent. But we can take ourselves to be conventionally to be autonomous agents because, uh, you know, uh, we are not ultimately, uh, you know, this, um, this thing, but we can lightly think of ourselves uh, as uh, this bundle, this thing, uh, but paying more attention to changing our qualities because we realize we're a bunch of qualities. It is uh, this, um, this bundles, uh, this sort of bundle, uh, um, but this a bundle of events, this individuated stream that is the person that we grasp as a self, but we can grasp it much more lightly. And we know we always have uh, free will in that sense because we have the possibility of evaluating and acting. Uh, and uh, even the Western idea, it's always in a context that we exercise free will. But the Buddhist is just bringing in the context uh, you know, um, as, uh, as the conditions, but conditions are not determining in that way. These sorts of, sorts of uh, causes and conditions are just the context. We're free to act in any context. Thank I think you. we need to perhaps talk about this a bit more, but I don't think it's, uh, yeah. Agency Thank described to the stream, uh, which we can think of as a person or a self. Thank like you. Thank you, Dr. Shalini Sinha. That's a fantastic opportunity for all of us to engage with you, get to know a little bit more about this fascinating area of thought, uh, particularly at, at Wolverhampton, we are very interested in decolonizing the curriculum, and this is our opportunity to make our audience, students as well as staff and others who've joined with us, to, to appreciate the depth of uh, a contribution we can have from the many traditions which have not been mainstreamed in uh, Western political philosophy, de philosophy departments. And uh, yours doc was an example of how we can do it. And uh, that is what we try to do as well in Wolverhampton. So uh, thank you very much once again. I've just put in our Twitter handle in the chat uh, and uh, everybody's free to tweet uh, about this lecture and about um, your experience of listening to Shalini. We have another Royal Institute of Philosophy lecture next week, which is uh, by Dr. Stefano Pippa, who is from Milan, from Italy. In COVID situations, it's possible to invite people from anywhere. So we've got Stefano and he's going to talk about Althusser. So it's a quite a different area. It's on uh, over-interpolation, it's uh, on uh, reinterpreting uh, um, uh, Althusser's views on ideology. So you're all welcome to attend that same time, four to five next Thursday on the 20th of May. Thank you, Shalini, and thank you everyone who has stayed with us right till the end. Bye-bye. And thank you very much, uh, Mina, and everyone who's attended. It's been absolutely stunningly enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.